Good afternoon. I um, want to welcome you once again to our channel where we study Bible topics and learn to get a more deeper understanding of the truth as presented in the scriptures. Today, our topic, we well, want to talk about victory over sin. But to be able to talk about victory over sin, we need to understand what sin is, what is the nature of the sin that brings corruption, and how does sin work in our lives. Without spending too much time, let us go quickly to the book of 1 John, chapter 3, we're going to read verse 4, uh, which I believe is the only definition of sin in the entire Bible. 1 John, chapter 3, and verse 4. The Bible says, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So the Bible is very clear that sin is the transgression of the law. Uh, in other words, if there is a law that has been set, and when people do not live in conformity to that law, not living in conformity to the law, is what is referred to as sin. Notice also in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17. It says, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is not there is a sin not unto death. So here the Bible says, All unrighteousness is sin. It says, All unrighteousness is sin. Which means if we were to think about victory over sin, it's righteousness. When we live a life of righteousness, um, strictly speaking, that is victory over sin. But now, let us try to understand what is the nature of the sin. How do we sin and how does sin take hold upon the life? Notice in the book of Genesis chapter 2, the very first conversation between God and man. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So God gives to the man information to use to make a decision. You notice that, according to the Bible, Abraham was created sinless. But while created sinless, he did not have a character. Because the characters are not created, characters develop as people make choices, they make rational decisions. And to be able to make a rational decision, a man needs information. So what God is giving Adam here, is information to use in making a decision. So the Bible says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now I want you to notice in Genesis 3 and verse 17, this is after Adam had eaten of the tree, God told him not to eat. The Bible says, And unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, for in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So you notice here, that the Bible says Adam actually had a choice to make. What God said versus what Eve suggested. And when God comes to Adam in Genesis 3 verse 17, he says, because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat of it. So we see that here, sin while it is the transgression of the law, but we sin when we make a choice to go against what God has commanded. So the Bible says, For by one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all had sinned. According to Romans 5 and verse 12, By one man sin entered the world. How did Adam sin? He chose to go against what God 
had commanded him. In other words, when we choose to go against God, clearly revealed will, in the decision to go against God, that is where the sin lies. Which means sin acts upon the mind. Sin is the choice to go against what God says. Now there are things that we need to understand. Sometimes people, when you tell them that sin is a choice, uh, it sounds too simplistic, even though it's the Bible, Bible position, because there are a lot of things that come to the minds of people and want to investigate some of these things. How does sin actually retain its word? Let us examine a little bit um, the nature of sin when it is in the life. Notice in the book of Proverbs chapter 5, and verse 22. Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 22. We want to look here at the effects of sin, like how sin manifests itself in the life. Proverbs chapter 5, notice and verse 22, it says, His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and they shall be hoarded with the cords of his sins. So the Bible says that sin here develop cords. In other words, um, it, 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 it integrates in the life such that the cords of sin bind the life. If you might think of it, it controls the mind. It controls the decisions that the person is able to make. Such that in anything that the person wants to do, the sin dominates in the life through the cords uh, of sin which expresses how sin retains its hold upon the life. So number one, we see here that sin does what? It, it, it enmeshes in the life with the cause. The sinner himself um, is holding with the cause of his sins. And I want you to notice that the Bible here calls iniquities and then interchangeably uses the word sins. In other words, when a person continues in the path of choosing to go against God, Cords of sin develop in the life, the iniquities that takes hold of the person. So that it becomes easy to repeat the same sin over and over again. In other words, it, infirmities or weaknesses actually develop in the life because of the sin. Notice another aspect also to sin presented in Genesis chapter 4. Another aspect to sin in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, we are going to read uh, in verse 7. It says, If you do well, shall thou not be accepted? And if you do us not well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now notice here, the Bible is talking about the power of sin. It says, God is speaking to Cain, and he says to him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do us not well, in other words, you go against what God has established to be good. It says, and if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. In other words, the desire here for sin is to dominate the life. In other words, what the Bible is talking about here, it is the power of sin. We first saw the power of sin in the cause of sin. Here we see the power of sin as in the control it does upon the life. In other words, sin bears dominance upon the life when people choose to go against God's clearly revealed will. This is also the power that is made more clearer in the book of Romans chapter 7. Notice in the book of Romans chapter 7, speaking of the power of the power of sin, in the book of Romans chapter 7, this is what Paul has to say. Notice Romans chapter 7 in verse 14. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am canal, sword under sin. So notice here. A person who is canal is said to be sold under sin. Now, the meaning of the word canal is depraved. It referred to the lower or best passions of the nature, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lies of the eyes, and the pride of life. These things that control the man. 
In other words, when we are sold under sin or when we are under the power of sin, sin works through the lust and it controls the man. So Paul says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am canal sold under sin. Notice the experience of someone who is sold under sin in verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that I do. So in the life of a person who is sold under sin, there is a contradiction in the sense that what the, the good that the person seeks to do, they do not have power to do it. Why? Because the depraved nature holds power over the being. It holds the power over the being. So the power of sin works through the power uh, of strengthened, depraved nature. The corruptions of sin. The corruptions of sin. Notice also uh, in, in, in the same book, Romans chapter 7 and verse um, 18. It says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. So here you see the power of sin being exercised, that even though the man knows what is good, there is not power in him to do it, because there is a power working in the man through the best or corrupt nature that molds or controls the life. This is the power of sin. We also notice that it is also expressed as in the cause that holds the man in a path of wrongdoing. Notice another aspect also to sin in the book of Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse um, so it's Hebrews chapter 3, yes, uh, and verse 13. Let's start from verse 12 for context purposes. It says, Take heed, brethren, lest there, be, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So the Bible here says sin is deceitful. Sin is deceitful. In other words, sometimes people believe that they are going to overcome a particular sin at a specific time or at some point in time. And as they continue, they continue in it. But the deception is that as men continue in sin, they become more hardened by the cause of sin. They become more depraved in the lower nature such that there is less and less power for them to make a resolve to fight against that sin. That is the deceitfulness of sin. And through the deceitfulness of sin, sin takes more hold upon the life. Now, I want you to notice how this deceitfulness works in verse 12. It says, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. In other words, um, in, 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 other, in other writings, the apostle calls it a root of bitterness. In other words, Satan works through different agencies, sometimes through depression, sometimes through disappointments, sometimes through the conditions of life that makes people to cast doubt upon the promises of God, that makes people to, to believe that God might be working against them and hence they begin to depart from the living God. They are less inclined to listen to him and as they do so, they are deceived into being hardened by the cause of sin in choosing to go against God. So let us notice the other aspect to sin also in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We are going to read verse 24. It says, by faith, when Moses was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So notice another aspect to sin also is the pleasures of sin. In other words, sin always presents itself 
in, 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 in perceptions of momentary pleasures that can be gained in choosing a course of wrongdoing. Sometimes the pleasures might be sensual pleasure as when people choose to go uh, and commit fornication. Sometimes it might be personal exaltation that prompts things such as lies, gossip, and so forth. All these things are the pleasures, though hidden, but they are the pleasures that make sin to become more attractive such that people sometimes find it easy to do sin. So notice according to the Bible, it's very clear sin is the transgression of God's law. We sin when we make a choice to go against God's clearly revealed will. But now, notice the Bible says when we sin, how sin works in the life. Number one, it says sin is deceitful. In the sense that the more we go against God, the more we become entangled in the sin, the more the sin lays hold upon us. How is the power of sin exercised in the life? Through and strengthening the best passions through strengthening the lower nature so that it begins to control the entire being. The Bible also talks about the pleasures of sin. That which Satan presents when he tempts men to lure them to go against obeying God. So we have the pleasures of sin, we have the deceitfulness of sin, we have the cords of sin, and we also have the power of sin that operates in the life. Notice in the book of James chapter 1 and verse um, James chapter 1 and verse 13. The Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. God is not tempted with evil, and God does not tempt any man with evil. Now notice in verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So the Bible says every man is tempted when he is drawn of his own lust and what? And enticed. Now verse 15, then when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. In other words, that which brings temptation upon men is in men. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is what constitutes the depraved nature. In other words, the heart of men. Which Jesus says in the book of Mark chapter 7 and verse 21, that out of the heart of men proceeded evil thought. In other words, the evil, the evil is in men. And how does temptation work? By enticing men to follow through with the evil of his nature. So now, when we sin, that nature is strengthened. But when we overcome sin, that nature is weakened. This also shows that the habits of life can strengthen the power of temptation upon the life. That which strengthens the lower nature strengthens the power of temptation to sin. In other words, habits such as intemperance, uh, gossiping, the, the way people feed the imagination, all these things have the potential and the power to strengthen temptation upon the life. Meaning that by the habits of life, by the choices of everyday activities, people can choose to strengthen the power of temptation or they can choose to weaken the power of temptation. But in all cases through these things, the evil one tempts men to, to allure them to go against God's clearly revealed will. Notice also in the book of James chapter 4 and verse 17, the apostle writes and he says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, here's another aspect to sin that actually says, For a person to sin, or to have sin accounted to them, they must be at a stage when they can differentiate between good and evil. In other words, they have to be able to make a rational decision to go against a clearly revealed and clearly understood will of God. So the Bible says, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, let us revisit a little bit what we have said so far. We see from the Bible that sin is a choice 
expressed by going against God's clearly revealed will. And the Bible is very clear, according to James chapter 4 and verse 17, you have to be somebody who can think and who can reason, who can clearly understand or judge between good and evil to be called a sinner. Why am I raising this point? It explains why in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, for example, we do not believe in the baptism of infants. Yes, they might do things that may be called sin, but because they are not at the stage where they understand what they are doing, sin is not accounted to them. Sin is accounted when the man, when the woman is rational enough to know what they are doing. They can differentiate between good and evil. And that's when, when they choose to go against God, it is accounted to be sin. But in the very simplest of choice, to go against God's clearly revealed will is a whole work of corruption that happens within men. In, in, in which by sin, the iniquities of the life develop cause that was the man in sin, by which the power of sin is strengthened upon the man, such that the pleasures of sin become more attractive and men are deceived, such that while in the life there is a constant desire to want to overcome sin, but because the lower nature is strengthened above the spiritual nature, sin becomes the order of life. And what is revealed in the life is continued, repeated, and, and, and dominating sin. But the comforting thing in the scriptures is that there is victory over sin that is found only through the gift of power that is called grace that we find in Jesus. In the next segment, we're going to look at victory over sin. May God bless the realm of his word.